Hello, hello, everybody. We have 55 minutes, so I'm going to get right into this. Uh, firstly, I'm going to start out by telling you some other content that you can check out uh, that kind of supports this. I have a presentation. It's available for free right now. It's a three-hour um, in-depth research study of creation stories of ancient civilizations, the origin stories. I went over hundreds of origin stories of different civilizations, and I pieced them together and uh, made them into sections. We have a section on sound and vibration in creation stories. We have a section on, well, I guess I have a section on extraterrestrials and um, their and origin stories about that. Um, spider woman, uh, ancient stories, uh, fractal geometry in ancient stories. And then through that, it's an exploration of many different ancient civilizations. It's truly beautiful. And it's also story time. We, I actually, pick quite a few ancient origin stories and we do a story time within this presentation of three hours in which i'm going into details about what happened with these gods of egypt and greece and india and way more beyond that so if you're interested in that you can go to portal to ascension.org sign up for free you'll get username and password and you can view that and then in the end of it what I did was I took out all the most common pieces of all the creation stories that I went through and I created my own origin story utilizing every one that I had come across to create kind of create an encompassing um, origin story for all of humanity. That was my original purpose, as I said earlier today, that when I got into all of this, it was really to find the root of our religion. And through that, I discovered a lot of ancient civilizations. And then another presentation that I'm going to be doing is called Journey Through the Maya Empire. And I... I don't know if it was on Omar's or Leo's um, call we had a few months ago. I did a little sample of this one. And um, it basically, I've been down with my wife to the Yucatan three times, and we've made a connection with local Mayan family there. And also, we actually have sponsored and built a portal to Ascension, Temescal, which is a sweat lodge, right in the center heartland of the Yucatan that isn't owned by corporations because the corporations and hotels have taken over all the mezcals. It's like there is no sacred one utilized anymore. So we help this family build it. And this one is its not like a your regular esoteric spiritual Mayan UFO disclosure kind of presentation. This is a practical guide to the Mayan empire. It's going to be videos, images, and discoveries that we found ourselves. So a lot of images of us at these places and videos. And it's going to be a journey, the entirety of the Yucatan Peninsula at all these ancient sites, even Chiapas, which is Palenque, and then also Belize, where we're going to go to Alton Ha. So if you're interested in that, the dates change to January 24th. You can check that out on our website, uh, portal to ascension.org. And then here's another one we're doing. These are just upcoming events. We do 100 plus a year. We have a three day first ever conference on the phenomena of walk ins. We have over, we have 20 walk ins and we have uh, two researchers. So this is going to be three days, epic event. If you're interested in that, please do go to that website as well and check that out. All right. So now before we get into the story of, what we're going to be exploring today, it's good to know kind of, you know, how I got to this in the first place. You know, I told everybody a while um, earlier, and I guess if you really want to know more about my journey, go to Portal to Ascension, go to the About page. But in 2006, 2008, uh, fast forwarding, I created a few tours and um, in international traveling tours, one called Galactic Remembrance with UFOs and ET channeling and another one, the Sound of Vibration. And this is really the beginning of our events. 2012 and 2013, we created two really large events called Cosmic Reunion 2012 and Cosmic Reunion 4th Density. And these were also three-day conferences. And 2012 was really the milestone of my evolution into where I am today. And now you can go into our website and we have thousands of hours of content there. So please do go ahead and check it out. And you can see this is how it's kind of presented. We're upgrading our site right now. It's going to be pretty epic. And there's also history documentaries on ancient history there. Um, there's a documentary on Peru we did, one in the Yucatan, one in Belize, actually five in the Yucatan. and then the one in Morocco is coming up pretty soon. All right, so now why we're all here. Pagan Roots of Christmas. Really, when, when I say the Pagan Roots of Christmas, it's really about why did I choose to really go into and delve into this. I did create this presentation for this event today, but it's something that has been on my mind for quite some time and I wanted to explore. And I'm very happy actually that working with Omar and doing these presentations actually inspires me to create this because I would be procrastinating otherwise. So I chose this because Many people, believe it or not, do not know that Christmas comes from pagan roots. And the question really would be to some people that have no awareness of this because they think it's Jesus' birthday and only, and it's a Christmas Christian holiday, is how can the most celebrated holiday that is 
<clears throat> that is from a monotheistic religion, Christianity, be connected to a polytheistic religion, a religion of paganism. How where does that how does that connect? And you know, part of the story is because all monotheistic religions come from older religions or uh, beliefs that had multiple gods. And then why does Christmas have pagan roots? That's what we're going to explore today. And then also we're going to explore the origin of the Christmas tree. Why are we using the Christmas tree like we're using it? Why did we ever come across and start using presents, right? Why are we gifting people things? And then ornaments, well, why do we use ornaments? And then we're going to end with Santa Claus and the festival Saturnalia in Rome, which is going to lead us into a conversation on Saturn. And then, of course, the Christ consciousness. So these are the kind of points that I want you to, we, we're going to be exploring in the next 40 minutes. So the winter solstice, right, today. The winter solstice has been celebrated in antiquity. It's seen as a significant time of year in many cultures and has been marked by festivals and rituals. It marked the symbolic death and rebirth of the sun. So I don't know if anybody was here earlier today when I talked about my poem, uh, the sun dies in the 22nd, dies in the skies, reflects over oceans. It seems that what happens during solstice and equinox is the angle of the sun pretty much looks like it stays the same for three days, whereas usually is progressing quite a lot more than what it does on these three days. So for many ancient cultures, it was the representation of the sun dying and being reborn again. So we see the winter solstice is not just a celebration from the transition of seasons, but it's really a, a celebration of the death and the rebirth of the sun. That's what we see through pagan um, tradition. And I know saying these words already are probably sparking things in your head when I'm saying words like death of the sun, right? So we have the, the Mayan calendar connection of the December 21st, which also has to do with the shifting of the seasons and the death and the rebirth of their sun god. And then we have the three days of darkness or light. Um, I'm pretty sure many of you have heard this concept, three days of darkness. It's actually or three days of light. Uh, many different speakers on the conscious circuit talk about it all the time. Uh, it's in the. Uh, it happened in Jericho when David was going around the town with trumpets, trying to bring the walls down. There was three days of light. The sun stopped in one place, and then there's been prophecies and channelers that have said that we're going to know we're ascending when we have three days of um, darkness, that everything goes out, and that doesn't have to represent actually darkness. But for a lot of people in ancient traditions and cultures that actually created this content right created these this um the scriptures we're referring to the sun being at a certain angle and not moving anymore so that's the three days of darkness or three days of light depending where you are on the planet so here are some gods of the solstice let's give some reverence to these gods we have ancient cultures viewed the solstice as the death and a rebirth as we just said often symbolized by the death and rebirth of the sun this translates to the sun god of the respective culture. In many tribes, ancient civilizations, the gods were the exact same except with a different name. So we see the same pantheon of gods being all over the place. And then if you look into detail of who these gods were, what their characters were, what their traits were, who their brothers and sisters were, you see that it's the exact same story just all over the entire planet. And this is kind of pre um, even though they have been monotheistic, civilizations that have popped up you know throughout antiquity this is pre you know like christianity judaism and islam so here are some gods sun gods of the solstice we have the greek god we have uh, the amaratsu from japan baldur which is the norse god mithras which is roman demeter greek horus egypt and if you start dissecting these gods you see they have very similar traits and the solstice was actually their celebration of them dying and being reborn and then we have, which is someone who's interesting here that some of you might um, know or heard of before, is Krampus, the son of hell. The Norse of hell is the Norse god of the underworld, right? So look here, we got the son of hell, H-E-L, the origin of the word hell, Norse god of the underworld. With the spread of Christianity, Krampus became associated with Christmas, despite efforts by the Catholic Church to ban him. So the Catholic Church did not want Krampus, the Norse god, to get involved in Christianity or Christmas at all. And then we have the Spider Woman, which was a god that was celebrated by the Hopi, at, which represent really the sun's victory over winter's darkness. The sun's victory over winter's darkness. And many, many more. I only added a few out of hundreds of them right there. So now we have... The sun god, right? So we have the sun god, sounds very similar to the son of god. 
and then we know that the sun stops at the same angle and begins to move three days later. So the sun dies and is reborn. So this is how the tradition not only was, you know, taken from paganism and incorporated in order to bring more people into the faith and tradition, but there were similarities anyway because these stories came from original source and the original source had that sun god element to it so jesus became the son of god which was now the new sun god this is the new sun god of that period that was going to be worshipped during the time of the solstice so there's a couple of different theories there's the calculation theory and there's the christian uh, christianization theory and these are the theories on why paganism was adopted by christianity in, and why december 25th became christmas right the calculation theory which i haven't put on here because i i don't resonate it with too much but i'll tell you is actually adopted mainly by christians in which they believe that um they have a date in which jesus was conceived and because of that date they calculate nine months into the future and that happens to be december 25th so that's what's put out by you know christendom is that that is the calculation theory the christianization theory is that the major purpose for this was to incorporate a widely used pagan holiday to provide an incentive and an, an excitement in those who were being forced to convert to christianity so the catholic church they didn't like the holiday at all like when it first got adopted don't think every christian was all about it because they weren't and the devout christians refuse like utterly refuse to celebrate it because it really made them feel that they were lesser than and they were born into christianity or they didn't have the pagan connection and roots and they didn't want to associate their purity what they believe to be their purity of christianity with anything from the pagan world so completely denied it for hundreds of years it was mainly celebrated by recently converted pagans that's pretty much how it was in the beginning. And eventually Catholicism accepted Christmas. However, the Protestants held out for much longer and hated the holiday. So fast forward hundreds of years, like 800, 900 AD, we have Catholicism starting to accept it. But the Protestants that came after that began to reject it. And then when the U.S. was actually created in the 1600s, um, well, before the U.S. independence, but in the 1600s, there was actually a, a ban in the north of the US for Christmas entirely. They completely banned it because they didn't, you know, they didn't really resonate with or its origins or what it represented. And they did not think that it had anything to do with Christianity and the birth of Christ. So it wasn't accepted for quite some time. Now, here we go again. Christians banned Christmas. Puritans in England overthrew King Charles in 1647. Among their first items of business after chopping off the monarch's head was to ban Christmas. Parliament decreed that December 25th should be instead a day of fasting and humiliation for Englishmen to account for their sins. And New England then New England banned it at the same time due to the Purit Puritans there. So why didn't they like it? Because it wasn't really a part of what they believed to be Christianity. They felt that it kind of dirtied them to even be involved in this holiday. Christianity hijacks Christmas. Pagan traditions and stories created the foundation of um, over Christmas. Or, for example, here's, now we're going to get into some stories okay, of some of these things that we've incorporated into the Christmas holiday that is you would never even imagine, you know, what the origin is. So here's the origin of mistletoe. Baldur's, which is a Norse god, there's a lot of Norse connection here in Christmas, uh, which is the mo and Baldur's mother, Frigga, honored Baldur and asked all of nature to promise not to harm him. Unfortunately, in her haste, Frigga overlooked the mistletoe plant. So Loki, the resident trickster, took advantage of the opportunity and fooled Baldur's blind twin, Hoder, into killing him with a spear made of mistletoe. Baldur was later restored to life. So isn't that beautiful? I mean, just like the whole concept of these stories that are so um, ancient and are talking about some celestial gods um, creating all this epicness and uh, creating life and existence is really the origin of it. And who would have known that was the origin of actually why we use mistletoe today. Now let's go into the Christmas trees and presents. The use and purpose for the Christmas tree dates back to the time of shamans and mystics in pagan Europe before the conquest of, of Rome, before Rome con conquered all the lands that they dubbed as barbaric. So even before that, even before the birth of Christ, this was, this was done. The pur purpose of the Christmas tree dated back to those times. During the solstice, what would happen is 
So I'm going to take a little pause here because this is an independent story that I really want to dive into and have you understand. So the story goes that during the solstice, the shamans would collect Amanita muscara mushrooms, right? And uh, I think I have an image here. Yep, here we go. Here's the mushroom. So the shamans would collect these mushrooms on December 21st, today. And then they will leave them to dry on the branches of Christmas trees. Hmm. And they are toxic. I got to go, go hmm on that one too. That's pretty interesting. I had no idea, Neil. Sorry to interrupt, but I had to say. No. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing. So they started putting them on the branches of Christmas trees. Why? Because they could not eat them while they were wet. They had to dry out. And how long did it take? Three days. The whole entire solstice when the sun is at one angle in the sky pumping down on these mushrooms. Um, so they are toxic, but they become less lethal when dried out. Sorry to interrupt again, Neil. Yeah, but uh, the uh, hanging of mushrooms, is that connected to, uh, you know, like the uh, balls and stuff that we hang on our yes. crease so today? That's in two slides from now. Yep, exactly. That's definitely it. So... So yes, they are toxic, but they become less lethal when dried out, which is why they dried them on the trees for three days because there was a lot of places there was snow, especially in the Arctic, because the shamans in the Arctic did the exact same thing. And they would dry them out, and then they would come back and get them on the 25th or 24th, you know, around about that time. So they're conveniently grown in, in most commonly under pine trees because their spores travel exclusively on pine seeds this mushroom. So the shaman would often hang them on lower branches of the pine they were growing under to dry out before the taking them back to the village. But what would happen? What would happen to these mushrooms? Let's get into that. So yes, the original ornament, if you go back into like times when they were first starting to put ornaments on trees, they're all mushrooms. They're all these type of mushrooms. This was the original ornament. So <clears throat> now we're going to get into Rudolph. Rudolph exposed, guys. This is an expose on Rudolph. I'm about to expose him. <laughs> so while the mushrooms would hang out to dry, these deer would come and consume some of the mushrooms. They would just mosey on up to it. And there was, I mean, if you got some delicious looking fungus hanging off a branch and you're a hungry deer in the snow, you're going to probably try to munch on them. So the deers would munch on the mushrooms and they would get high and like stumbly and drunk looking. And... They would get high because of the fungi, and then they would literally piss themselves. They would urinate themselves because of how high they were. So the shaman and other members of the tribe would drink the snow, the piss, and with the urine to get a tea-like mushroom experience because through urine, it actually lowers the toxicity of this mushroom, and you're able to um, drink it and get a, basically a fade from it, get high off it without having the toxic element in it. So they would come back, they would drink the, the urine of these deer, and they would get really psychedelically tapped into some type of consciousness, right? And what would happen when they would do that? The deer looked like they were flying. <laughs> Literally, like, this is where Rudolph comes from. The red nose on Rudolph, he's eating a, 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 a Manita mascara mushroom. That's why he's got a red nose. Why they're flying? Because the shamans and, and the deer were both really high on fungus. They started getting the stories of flying deer. This is believed to be, so this is actually believed to be the origin. And if you look this up, like this isn't just, I'm not just saying this lightly. This is actually the only um, explanation that they've discovered on the origin of the words getting pissed in a different language, of course, but translated it's getting pissed. So the origin of the word getting pissed, they track back to the shamans consuming urine, not only from the deer, but from each other. They would basically, the shamans would um, eat the mushrooms, they would urinate, and then they would give their urine to other peoples of the tribe that would also get the psychedelic experiences, and they would all be getting pissed because they'd be drinking the urine. So it, so it implies drinking urine from an animal or a person who has consumed mushrooms. Rudolph is the evolution of an individual being so high on mushrooms that deers can fly. So who is Santa, right? The guy that actually um, takes these deers and travels around. But what does he travel around with? So not only have we now discovered that the original present, the original present was the mushroom. You have the pine tree, you have the mushrooms underneath. 
What are the gifts? What are the presents? The mushrooms. This is the origin of gifting for Christmas. What are the ornaments? The presents dried upside down on the tree leaves in order to dry them out so that people can get the psychedelic experience. So we got the origin of the tree there. We have the origin of the um, gifts under the tree. And now we have the origin of the ornaments also on top of it. And what was Santa going around with that bag full of goodies doing? The whole story of Santa jumping in a sleigh with high reindeers on fungi is because Santa was carrying a bag of mushrooms and going to his local community, his tribe, and handing out the mushrooms to all the people. That's what it was all about, handing these mushrooms out. So deers were just a way of transport. And in order for Santa to be able to travel and hit everybody up, the deers were flying from place to place. So the original Santa, though, was actually commonly depicted of more of a gnome-like little man, often skinny and a little scary. So the Santa that we know nowadays wasn't the original Santa. It was just like, like you see these images here. He looks kind of like a creeper, right? Like he looks like he's trying to creep and do something. Like he's so a gnome and a lot of times depicted really like kind of almost satanic. Like it was a scary fella. So he would go around and he would transport the mushrooms. So this leads me into these images here. And I don't know if any of you know who this is, but this is the Smurfs. So if you know anything about the Smurfs, the Smurfs is the story of Santa the shaman transporting mushrooms to the local community. That is the whole. And if you go to Disneyland, you'll see this I'm, I'm Anita mascara mushroom everywhere, everywhere. Go to Disneyland. I went there um, 11 years ago and I went there one time just to take pictures of mushrooms. And that was on my Facebook that got deleted. I had a whole album on mushroom, I'm neatest mascara mushrooms at Disneyland. And uh, it's because they put it in all of their, like, this is all over the place. It's kids watch this stuff. And, you know, we're following Christmas. Christmas is a like a family holiday, but it's all about mushrooms and psychedelics and connecting to the Christ consciousness because mushrooms connects us to the Christ consciousness, which we'll get to in a second. And even the Smurfs was a blatant depiction of the Amanita mascara mushroom and the gnome-like beings that used to transport the mushrooms. The, the Smurfs are the shamans. They even have that similar look to it. They have the hat like they're a wizard. They have the gnome-like features. They were the um, shaman that used to go and collect the mushrooms and transport them from town to town. So Santa origins, the root, the roots of Santa bags of gifts, sleigh, reindeer, midnight flight, distinctive chimney based means of entry into the home. And even the way we decorate our houses at Christmas lead to the ancestral traditions of a number of indigenous Arctic circle dwellers north in the north. The Kamach Dales and the Koryaks of Siberia specifically Word. So these tribes right here, if you really, really want to take this to heart today and you want to know who, which out of all these indigenous tribes had the most connection to any type of origin of Christmas, it's these two right here, Kamachadales and the Koryaks of Siberia, right? And then here's their story. So I told you the Anglo-Saxon story, the Germanic tribe story, but look at the similarities here. We have connected to the god and planet Saturn, right, Santa, also, the Roman guard Saturnalia. So, Saturn, Santa was celebrated for hundreds of years before this, but every single culture that came afterwards seemed to appropriate some sort of being that had a connection to this Santa figure that was just an evolution of it. Many times it was the same kind of being, just in a different culture with a different language. But when you go into, into, um, Rome, you have Saturnalia, which was a really beautiful high level energy celebration where the peasants would become the kings and the queens and uh, and the overlords and and the um, and the overlords would become the peasants for the day and everybody would celebrate at night and that was how it was celebrated. The solstice was celebrated in the warm climate of Rome, but then you go to north to the Germanic tribes that have the origin stories of similar gods from the same pantheon of gods, but you have these dark. Uh, darkest stories and even festivals that don't seem to be embodying the festivities that they had in Rome in this lustful society, but they have the similar origins. So it's, it's important to note 
that a lot of these cultures, even though they had similar origins and similar stories, the cultures and the stories became very different because of their climate, their um, the surroundings, other culture influences. So the climate, for example, was a huge played a huge role in the way these solstices were celebrated and even what kind of god they were really connecting to. So on the night of the winter solstice, right? This is the tribal information for these two tribes that I just specified, on the night of the winter solstice, a shaman would gather several hallucinogenic mushrooms called Amanita muscara or fly an agaric in English and then launch them, um, launch them himself into a spiritual journey to the tree of life, which was a large pine, here we go again, which lived by the North Star and held the answer to all the village's problems from the previous year. Even Santa's outfit Guys, is designed like an Amanita mascara mushroom. And I think I, I think I skipped the part on Coca-Cola here because I wanted to talk about it. Yeah, no, we got it there. Okay. So even his his outfit. Do I have his outfit here? No, I don't. But even his outfit, the red uh, outfit with the black boots, is actually a representation of the mushroom because under the ground, that um beige white stem of that mushroom is actually black so which represents the boots so it was really a huge depiction of the actual mushroom and um here we go with saturnalia no no going back a bit so saturnalia a holiday in honor of saturn the god of agriculture was celebrated beginning in the week leading up to the winter solstice and continuing for a full month Saturnalia was a hedonistic time when food and drink were plentiful and the normal Roman social order was turned upside down. Romans also observed Juvenalia, a feast honoring the children of Rome. In addition, members of the upper classes often celebrated the birthday of Mithra, the god of the unconquerable sun. Here we go. We have the sun god now in Rome. On December 25th, it was believed that Mithra, an infant god, was born off a rock for some Romans, Mithra's birthday was the most sacred day of the year. So Saturnalia, the festival normally lasted around December 17th to the 23rd. And it was when the gods of Saturn ruled Italy, there was complete equality and no slavery. That's what it, this is what it represented. So even though when Romans were actually celebrating Saturnalia, they were celebrating a time in the past that they believed Saturn, the actual god, or extraterrestrial ruled Italy on that area and was there was complete equality and no slavery, which is why on that day the slaves become the you know the overlords uh, and everybody's equal. But the interesting part is that it was actually utilized to further impose slavery. So even though they were celebrating a time of no slavery, they utilized it in order to impose slavery, which is what they do now in the modern Rome where I'm currently at in which they basically give you these holidays and these celebrations in order to uh, lesser the anxiety you get of living so that you don't get upset at all the corrupt BS that they're doing to you. So, because every time you're about to get worked up, you got a holiday, you got some sort of vacation, you got some sort of handout, and that's what they were doing there. That's what they're utilizing Christmas for. And it can even be argued that Christmas is still being used for that, right? So the slaves became the masters for the festival, providing them with a day to blow off steam this was the first purge. Actually, this was probably purges before. <laughs> it was like it was like a lesser version of the purge, providing them with a day to blow off steam, really used to reinforce slavery rather than focus on the equality that the day should represent. December 25th was considered to be the birthday of the Roman sun god Sol Invictus. Roman sun god, son of God, 325 AD, Constantine proclaimed himself the head of Christianity by creating what we know as modern Christianity. Or hopefully you guys are seeing the connections here. And now the Christian Santa, right? So we might have heard of St. Nicholas, who was a Turkish cardinal in the 14th century, who was known for his kindness to children. So even though this is how part of the Christian hijacking, it didn't, it wasn't until around the 14th century that Christianity started, uh, Catholicism started adopting Christianity on a hardcore level. Before that, it was very spontaneous, very sporadic. And then it wasn't even until the... 16th, 17th century, actually not even really until the 17th to 18th century that it was almost entirely accepted by the Christian world and started being celebrated. So imagine that 1700 years of resistance by the true Christians 
towards Christianity. So they had to make it their own, right? So all these stories of Krampus and uh, Santa and the Norse god and the Arctic Circle gods and all these different beings that represented Santa now shifted in the 14th century because it was becoming so widely spread. They needed to make it their own even more. So St. Nicholas was imposed on the Santa figure. Now we have the gifts, the mushrooms, the presents, the tree, and we have children incorporated into it now. So are you seeing the recipe here for modern Christmas? This was the immediate connection when Christmas began adopting the holiday. So, however, all the elements of Santa, including the pants, the hat, the bag, and more, all came from um, pagan shamanistic stories. In the 20th century, though, Coca-Cola played a role in the rebranding of Santa Claus, and he went from a gnome-like being to a chubby, happy-go-lucky Santa that we currently know. So we can thank commercialization, um, corporations, capitalism, cons um, consumerism, and Coca-Cola that had cocaine in it, and actually it still does, as the foundation of the Santa that we currently celebrate as this household figure that we love so much that we lie to our kids about exists. Santa Claus is based on, so this is what I want you to take away from this. Santa's origins and the origins of Christmas is based on psychedelic mushrooms as many of the Christmas traditions do. Psychedelics seem to be utilized globally in ancient stories and the creation of ancient text. And just to show you like really like this part right here is the underskirt of his jacket, like of Santa. This right here is the hat, which is like the white dot on the end of the hat. The, the hat of Santa is a cross between the mushroom cap and a warlock cap from a shaman in those ancient times. They used to wear those type of caps. So it's just so amazing, really, when you dissect and see how it came through. So I I celebrated Christmas my whole life because I'm English, born in, in England, Indian, uh, but I was raised with all these traditions and cultures. I wasn't Christian, but Hinduism, if you really, you know, go into deep into Hinduism, they actually accept all religions as what they're supposed to be. So you can celebrate whatever you want. And um, so I celebrated Christmas and then I became awake, you know, 18, 19, 20. And then as time progressed, I started phasing out my whole understanding of Christmas and really was like not about it anymore. And then I found out the mushroom origins of Christmas and I came right back to it. Cause I was like, oh yes, this right is what's up. Time to celebrate so, yeah. that one. Now, every Christmas I celebrate the mushrooms. And I'm going to probably do it on Christmas Day because, like, I've never done it on Christmas Day before, and I want to just do it on that day. But, um, yeah, it's it's about the psychedelic connection. And that gets into, you know, I'm going to finish this off right here. Just a couple of other um, points. Let's just make sure we're on the last slide. So the psychedelic origins of Christmas is really what it's all about. But if you look into many ancient cultures, you'll find out very soon that all, almost all these cultures have some sort of origin story that's based in a psychedelic or some sort of um, um, substance that they found that sort of tapping them into different types of awareness. For example, if you look at the Christian Bible, you have mana, which some people have said is some type of wine infused with mushrooms. Um, if you go into the Hindu text, you have bang, which is supposed to be some sort of mushroom infused with THC. And in the um, Rig Veda, there is a line, the Hindu text, the Vedic text that predates Hinduism, right? There's a line that says, drink from the mushroom sea and you will see God. How, how much more blatant can you get, right? Drinking from the mushroom sea, right. it was a it, metaphor it for the tea of the mushrooms. Yeah. That goes into the story of, you know, what does the mushroom represent and then how is this connected to Jesus? I'm hoping that from this explanation I've given today that you can see that not only was Christmas hijacked by Christianity, but Christmas was, um, but Christianity was also a progression of these ancient cultures. Why do we have the Son of God, and why do we worship the Sun God within Christianity? And all these cultures also symbolize the solstice for this. It was easy for them to transition and shift over because it wasn't really different. It wasn't a different God. What happened was it seems that there was a pantheon of gods, right? the origin stories of Pantheon of Gods. Most of these origin stories across the board, definitely all over Europe and India and, and, India and, and beyond, talks about uh, a group of gods that overthrew their parents. Zeus, for example, 
Zeus was not um, the the first god. He killed his parents, right, with Prometheus right. and yeah. um, with Poseidon. I mean, so like all these gods, it starts out with the killing of their parents, right? It's like in, in, insane how many cultures have that same story. And then all of a sudden, that these, there's these pantheon of gods. Like, just, let's just go with the Greek ones because they're commonly known. And um, these Greek gods were literally like. Uh, were worshipped by everyone until they split up and they had their differences. And then these gods started going off to different places and saying, hey, I'm the only god, screw the other gods. Case in point, go into the Old Testament. The Old Testament says the word Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created us in his image. That's what the Old Testament says. But the Old Testament was translated from um, in ancient Hebrew, but it was actually written in Phoenician Canaanite, which is a very similar text, like uh, writing style as ancient Hebrew, but there's a few differences. So in in Phoenician Canaanite, the word um, Elohim is a plural, right? So it doesn't mean God, and it doesn't even mean gods. It means goddesses. It's a female plural. So the original text of the um, Old Testament says the goddesses, created us in their image and in their likeness, right? So we have this first kind of delusion where we thought they were talking about one God, but it was multiple gods. And then later in the Old Testament, we have Yahweh saying, hey, Yahweh is one of the Elohim. And Elohim, by the way, translated in English means gods of Saturn, goddesses of Saturn, right? So you have, um, you have, uh, where was I? You have, Yahweh, which is one of the Elohim, one of the gods of Saturn, saying, hey, screw these other gods. I'm the only god. You can only worship me. Now we have the birth of Judaism. Soon later, we have the birth of Islam. And then and we also have the birth of Christianity. So all of these gods that came and started the December 25th, Jesus and all that, originated from the same pantheon of gods, except they just chose one. And this is the last component now that I'm going to show you. Trans we're transitioning into the world of Jesus, right? Many people do not know. When Jesus died, he didn't ascend to heaven. He descended to hell. So Jesus yeah. died for those three days. Before he was resurrected, he descended to hell. And it's called the harrowing of hell. I'm showing you right here on Wikipedia. And it's the whole concept of him going into Hades. This is all Greek connection, which connects to the Greek version of Jesus named Christo. Christo was the original Jesus in uh, in Greece, and he went into the realm of hell in order to basically bless people there, and then he didn't ascend until heaven until he resurrected or reincarnated um, back onto this earth. So it's a whole depiction of those cycles, the karmic cycles of going into our own hell and then coming back. So the harrowing of hell is of what we call. Exactly, the, the hero's journey, yep. basically. And yep. then now this goes into what Leo was speaking about earlier. I when I first got into okay so in 2001 2002 I was at Panera Bread for like 2 years I was like reading all I pretty much was doing was reading the Quran reading the Bible reading the seven tablets of creation and reading the Old Testament and I was trying to figure out what the similarities were and I was drawing and highlighting things that were the same and I started finding out that Jesus there's been many Jesuses over ancient history that not only were just like a savior, but have the exact same story as Jesus, right? Yep. And here's just a few of them. So some of these people here, right? So I'm just going to highlight this because a lot of them. These ones wow. right here on the top almost have all the exact same story of Jesus, right? Yep. Dating back yep. to, look, 1160 BC. That's 11, 100 years before Jesus. And then we yep. have all of these ones that have components of Jesus's life that almost like Jesus's life was taken out and dissected and made into a, the figure that we know. So one of two things came into my mind in 2002. Huh, either Jesus didn't exist because these just stories recirculated from ancient past. And there's a lot of evidence for that because there is no actual, there's a lot of information about the Romans, Romans but there is no actual text about Jesus from the Romans. There's yeah, Michael Feely touches. Michael Feely touches yep. on that, uh, where yeah, he yeah. talks about uh, Jesus being a uh, metaphor yep. for yep. Uh, higher consciousness. Yep, exactly, and that's the last component, the consciousness part. So either that is the case, 
or these beings are the exact same genetic makeup or soul group or extraterrestrial, whatever it is, coming down to the earth, living out the same history over and over. And Jesus was the next reflection of that. The, the one deity that Jesus has the most in common with is Krishna. Everything in Krishna's life, including a crucifixion, is the exact same as Jesus, virgin mother, um, carpenter dad, all of these things. So, and I'm just going to read this part here because it kind of drills it home. For example, some figures had miraculous or virgin births. They were son of, sons of supreme gods. They were born on December 25th. They had, uh, had stars point to their birthplaces. They were visited by shepherds as magi and infants. They fled from the death as children. They exhibited traits of divinity in childhood, spent time in the desert, traveled as they taught, had disciples, performed miracles. Many of them had 12 disciples too, by the way, were persecuted, were crucified, were descended into hell after death. Like how much more common can you similarities can you get? Right. And they appeared um, as resurrections or apparitions or ascended to into heaven. So this whole story of Jesus goes way beyond any of this so now final thoughts i'm going to bring it all together now so how does the mushroom this story of all these gods the son of god being a reflection and an evolution of the sun gods being worshipped um and the spirituality and ascension of the planet have in common so mushrooms i've i've done a lot of mushrooms i've done a lot of research on mushrooms <laughs> if, you, <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you look at if you had earth right here and you somehow could take a uh, a little cross section of earth, right? If you took a little cross section of earth and you looked underneath the soil of the whole entire planet, what would you see? You would see a newer network of spores and mm -hmm. wires, almost like um, your nervous system in your body. This is yep. true facts, right? And communication. The reason why is exactly, but it's actually fungus spores connecting a whole grid under the soil they connect and create this neural network so what's happening when you're eating a mushroom you're literally eating the consciousness of the planet because one mushroom is connected to the whole entire grid much like avatar and the tree and avatar so so you're eating the christ consciousness of the planet because the planet represents the christ consciousness so there's all these similarities and connections here and it all really circles back to why the mushroom was even utilized in christmas in the first place was when you're eating the mushroom you're eating the christ consciousness <clears throat> of the planet and you're tapping into the consciousness field of the earth which is why a lot of times when you do mushrooms if not every time um Everything starts to breathe. The world is alive. Mm -hmm. You're now into another reality, another zone where you see that everything is sentient, including the light on my table, including the desk. Why is it that everything moves? Because we're all made out of frequency. The frequency and the matter that makes a table is no different than me when it comes to the esoteric spiritual realm where this it's all energy, it's all matter. But through the AI that we have in this reality, through the programming that we've created and that source of God or the aliens have created for us, who knows? We have now become these individualized consciousnesses, and that is what Christmas is all about. And now this whole entire presentation is, I said, I just did it for, you know, for today. I am making it into a larger presentation, and I just want to take a moment here. I'm going to share screen my larger presentation that I'm going to eventually be doing, which is going to be a course on all this material, because you really can't, like, cover this so much i know leo as soon as leo like is let, let loose right now he's gonna freaking fill in a lot of gaps i feel it because this is <laughs> yeah, i'm patiently waiting yeah there's I'm, a I'm lot gonna, i'm gonna to show go the correlation on. with all christian religions you see right. tur it's turning the wheels are do you, turning yeah. do you see Here's my screen right now so and uh, then part four of this is the story of east europe from pagan to rush from pagan to russia modern russia this one I'm the most excited about. For a long time, I've been thinking, you know, like, there, it's not, how do I put this? You know, like, I guess the only way to put it really is it seems that the only other, it seems that the U.S., people from the U.S. really dislike Russia. You know, not the people, but maybe the government, right? And it seems like it's the only white people that have been demonized by white people in the U.S. and it's based mm -hmm. on ideology. So I was like, well, there's not really racist there because the Russian government and people there are treated like and spoke about very poorly. But they're also white people that have the same origins, even from the same t tribes in North, you know, Germanic tribes and, and more. So... I've wondered for many, many, many years now is what happened to create that first dissect 
Why do we have all this information about Germanic tribes moving into Western Roman Empire in around 300 AD when the Western Roman Empire started collapsing hardcore, but we don't talk about what happened in Russia? And was there some sort of division down that area right there from Eastern Europe to Western Europe in, in antiquity that we can explore? And guess what? I found out there was. There's a whole entire world of exploration and what occurred after the Roman Empire collapsed. If the Roman Empire did not collapse and the Germanic tribes did not move into the Western Roman Empire, the Russian Empire that is currently there now, the original tribes would never have had the opportunity to expand. So if it wasn't for the Germanic tribes, they would never have expanded from the original area going from north near Finland all the way down into um, south in, into a Iran area and then further east if it wasn't for that. So by the exploration of this, I found out that um, we can track the pagan tribes. So in this in this part of the presentation, we're going to track pagan tribes as they move into the collapsing empire. So we're going to follow these tribes and then we're going to see about how they integrated with the Iranian tribes and then um, the different stories of the Greek people, of the people on the east that were left to their own vices and nobody really messed with, and then how they became this huge empire and became the place of the czars. And then also we're going to explore the move from paganism to Christianity. And the Eastern Europe, believe it or not, didn't accept Christianity almost until like 1200 AD. So like, even though it was spreading all in, in Western Europe and people were accepting Christianity, not Christmas, but Christianity in general, they were still predominantly pagan and tribal um, had tribal understandings and worshiped gods that were the same Norse gods as the Vikings for hundreds, over a thousand years after this happened. So that one's gonna be the story of Eastern Europe. And then part five gonna end on the galactic history and the ascension where we're gonna talk, go into history about our galactic history and what that really represents for the Ascension. So if you guys are interested in this, go to my website, portaltoascension.org, sign up right there, and I will be sending emails out. And when this is ready for you to you know, explore, and uh, you'll get an email and you can join me on it. Mm -hmm.